Hi, today we are going to talk about prayer. If that's an overly religious word for you, let's say we're going to have a conversation, talk about having a conversation with God. Back in 2014, uh, with a property developer friend of mine, um, we went into business together and we decided to renovate a two bedroom terraced house. Now he'd done this many times before, I'd never done it before and only got a few DIY skills, but what, what can be difficult? I'm just gonna do up this house, all good, be great. Day one, I go down to the house, my friend's nowhere in sight, there's just me there, it's about quarter to nine in the morning, knock on the door and the people that have come to put the new windows and doors in have arrived. I'm super ex excited. This, this is going to be a great day. And I thought, what can I do? What can I do to help? Oh, I can make them a cup of tea. So I went into the kitchen to make a cup of tea. No kidding. I, almost as soon as I was boiling the kettle, just getting the mugs in place and the tea bags and the milk, just getting the, the stuff in place, ready to make the tea. There was this almighty crash upstairs like a seriously loud noise. So I went running upstairs to the front room. They were in the front room and they'd taken out the front bedroom window. And when they took the window out, they were stood there in the room holding the window and the wall that was holding the window in place fell out into the street. <laughs> Stay one. I'd got hardly any DIY skills. And the wall is literally in pieces, bricks and mortar all over the street. Got straight on the phone. It's got to be like five past nine. I've only been there 20 minutes. I'm like, mate, you need to get yourself down here. Uh, the bedroom wall is lying in the street. <laughs> so I spent about the next hour putting all the bricks and mortar into the skip that we'd hired while they got builders in. Anyway, long story short, we spent four months renovating this house. I was super proud of this work. It had gone really, really well for the most part, not completely well, as you already know. But for the most part, it had gone well. We got to the end of the process and I was looking around the house the day before the carpets had been put in and it's just looking great. I thought, oh, this is ready to sell. So I called my mate up and said, you need, to, you need to come down. I think we're about ready for estate agents to come in and let's get this house on the market and sold. And he came down and he took a look around and he was looking at the details around architrave and windows and around the skirting boards. He says, Andy, we're not quite done. I'm like, what do you mean? It's like, oh, you need a colker. I'm like, what's one of them? He says, oh, it's, it's like a tool that you use just to fill in the gaps. It'll fill in all the gaps and you've got loads of gaps around door frames, around windows. You can't have gaps like that. We've got to fill them in. He says, I'll run home. So he went home, came back about 45 minutes later and presented me with a colker. Now, I was vaguely familiar with one of these. <laughs> I think maybe my father-in-law had one and it might have used one, might have even used one in one of my houses that I'd lived in, but I'd never actually used this tool myself. I'm like, mate, I don't even know how to use this. He says, oh, I'll show you. So he, he gets the colker and he, he goes to around the architrave and he starts filling in around the architrave. I'm like, oh, that, yeah, I see what you mean. That's great. That's looking really good. And he hands it to me and says, you give it a go. So I started very clumsily. I didn't really know what I was doing. Picked up this colca and started down the architrave. It was a bit messy at first. It took me a bit of time to get used to. But over the course of the next few days, I managed to finish the job. We got the house sold pretty quickly. Actually, I was very happy with my work and I'd been introduced to a new tool, the Colca, which is now part of my toolbox at home. So for this conversation today, a conversation about God, I want to introduce you perhaps to a new tool. In the Bible, there's a toolbox of prayers there's 150 of them. They're called the Psalms. I've just opened my Bible to them. And today we're going to talk about how the Psalms are tools for prayer. Now, it's really important right at the start to understand that these prayers are not primarily about doing something. 
about getting something. They're actually about being and becoming. <laughs> now, that's where we get stuck because we're just not used to that, are we? We're used to tools for doing something. I use the caulker to do some caulking. You know, when we're a baby, we're given a plastic beaker and we hold onto the two handles and we might throw it around the room, hence it being plastic. But actually, once we get the hang of the fact we're supposed to drink out of it, we use the tool for what it was made for. Then we're given a plastic spoon and we eat our cereal. Hopefully, we don't throw it around the room, but we actually eat it because that's what the tool's for. We're given a plastic knife and fork and we use the knife to cut our food and the fork to put the food into our mouth. In this day and age, when you get a little bit older, you get given a phone. You've got a mobile phone and it's there for you to contact someone, to communicate with someone. It's there for someone to communicate with you and for all kinds of information. Lots of us have a computer. A computer is for information. It's for storing information. What I'm saying is this, we're, we're used to tools for doing stuff. We're not used to tools for being. And that's exactly what these prayer tools, these Psalms are for. They're for being and becoming. They're tools that God uses to work his will in us and tools that we use to collaborate in God's work with us. So there's a couple of things I want us to consider in this conversation today. The first is a bold statement. The Psalms are necessary. Now stay with me, I don't mean they're necessary to salvation, not in that sense, no, because that's a gracious work of faith that God does in our lives. And also, if your prayers and mine, our conversations with God, if they're clumsy, if they're skilled, if they're memorized, if they're memorized scripture, none of that actually gets any merit with God. In fact, one of my most common prayers that I, I would say pretty regularly pray is God, I just need your help today. And you know what? God loves that kind of prayer. That's the kind of prayer God responds to because it's authentic, because it's real. Simply help me. And the church throughout history has said that if we want to develop in a mature way in our relationship with God, if we want to mature in our humanity as people of God, if we want to worship him with all our heart, soul, mind and strength, then actually the Psalms are necessary. And you can't bypass them. You know, lots, lots of Christians, will, we might go to the Psalms because we want some comfort. It's a great place to go when you want some encouragement or comfort. But actually, the Psalms are not just for that. They're not just there to comfort you. That's the, not, it's not the primary reason for them. Because everything you could possibly feel or experience or say is brought into expression through the Psalms. If you like, the, the Psalms are our prayer masters. We apprentice ourselves to these tools, if you like, and when we end up becoming more and more ourselves. And we're in good company. Jesus prayed the Psalms. In fact, he talked the Psalms in his conversations more often than any other Old Testament book. In fact, when he was in his most suffering moment, when he was in absolute agony, hanging on a cross for you and me, his expression was a psalm. He said to his father, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's a prayer from Psalm 22. It's recorded in early Christian community that they were convinced actually that Jesus can continues to pray the Psalms through us as we pray them. So maybe the Psalms are necessary. The second thing to consider is this, the Psalms speak for us. Now we've heard our pastor Johnny Lee say this phrase a number of times this year. In fact, it's happened that often that it's kind of lodged in me and I thought, Do you know what, if I get an opportunity, I just want to unpack that, talk about that a bit more, get us to think about what it means for the Psalms to speak for us, 
for it to actually become our language, for, for everything that we can possibly feel and express to come before God in a psalm. You know, it's answering God who addresses us, who precedes us with his words, because th this is a mistake. We can think that we pray to seek God, but actually these psalms, these tools, they're a, they're a response to the God who seeks us. And so we answer him. God comes and speaks to each one of us in our lives. It could be that he catches us in sin or it's in a moment of despair or fear. Or he invades us by his grace and the Psalms are our answers. We speak to the God who speaks to us. So a title for my message today, if you want one, it would simply be this. Answering God. The Psalms as tools for prayer. Now, using them is really straightforward. It's simple enough. Just pray them regularly. Open your Bible. I'll just open my Bible randomly now. Here we go. Psalm 63. Let's, let's just pray this together for a moment. Oh God, you are my God. With my deepest longing, I will seek you. My soul, my life, my very self thirsts for you. My flesh longs and sighs for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I've gazed upon you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. And because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise you. And I will bless you as long as I live and I will lift up my hands in your name. This is how lots of Christians from most of the centuries have matured in prayer. Nothing fancy, just do it. The Psalms are tools for prayer. So let's talk about this toolbox that we've got. There's 150 of these Psalms. And here's a few details around these tools that I think are important to us. I think the first thing to mention is that the text has texture. <laughs> We get a feel for how the words are being used and how to take them. And getting the feel actually is really important to understanding the meaning because the Psalms are poetry and the Psalms are prayer. That's the texture of the text. Now, the thing about poetry is it's not so much teaching you something that you don't know but it's actually helping you see, helping you see something again, maybe something latent in you, maybe something forgotten, something you've overlooked, or even a feeling or something you might be trying to su suppress. And almost all of these 150 tools are in that sort of language. And so as a result, when we pray them, when we pray the Psalms, we should expect to experience that sense of our humanness before God being both exposed but sharpened. They're not providing so much to teach us about God, but to train us. They're like a tool, if you like, to train us in responding to him, answering God. Now, I don't know about you, but when I pray, I'm trying to leave behind me like a world of anxiety and enter a world of wonder. I'm trying to leave behind a self-centered world and enter a God-centered world. I'm trying to leave behind all my problems and enter a world of mystery. But that's not easy. And it's not easy because I'm used to anxiety. I'm used to being selfish. I'm, I'm used to problems. <laughs> And I'm not used to wonder, God, and mystery. And this is where the Psalms help us. In fact, the opening two Psalms, many of the Psalms are arranged in a way that really, really helps us. And the first two Psalms, Psalms 1 and 2, they prepare the way to pray. In fact, I remember learning Psalm, Psalm 1 when I was eight years old. I must confess it was 
purely selfish. I went to a, a kid's club in a church, a bit like Renewal Kids, if you like. I was eight years old and there was a big table full of prizes on the side and I wanted to win a prize. And this one particular day, the, the, the person at the front said, OK, if you learn completely memorize Psalm chapter one and you come next week, the first person to have learned Psalm chapter one will win a prize. Well, I was all over that. I spent all week learning Psalm chapter one. And we, when we got together for the kids club the next week, they were like, okay, who's learned the Psalm? I was straight up with my hand. They invited me out the front and I stood there, I think quite proudly, to be honest, as this eight year old kid, I was like, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And upon his law, he meditates day and night. He'd be like a tree that's planted by streams of water, whose leaf does not wither, bears fruit in season, and whatever he does prospers. The wicked are not so, but they're like the chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not be able to stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Much applause in the room at this kids club and I got my prize. I think it was a packet of sweets, but hey, it's a packet of sweets. I'll take it. But I guess I've come to learn over the years that that Psalm, it's right at the start of the Psalms for a reason because it's calling us to attention. It's, it's like it gathers me from my life of distraction and stuff and calls me to, to pay attention to God. Psalm two in a different way is very energetic and strong. It talks about our world and our world's influences and the way our world intimidates and and we end up living in fear potentially, but then it announces the Messiah, this, this God that is personally involved in our world, a God that is here and present and lives with us, among us, and is ruling and reigning, and we adore him. And so what do these two Psalms do in preparing us? They prepare the way because we come to attention and to a place of adoration. We pay attention to God, and we adore him. So we prepare to pray, not by composing a prayer, not by being clever, but by actually composing ourselves. And we don't first learn how to do it and then do it. No, just get involved in the midst, just talk to God. I remember I was, um, I was in a meeting recently and we were, we were encouraged in small groups to pray and someone in that group said to me, oh, I'd, I'd rather just listen to you pray. I'm, I'm just, I'm just going to listen. I'm not very good at praying. I'm like, no, no, no. It's not about whether you're good at something or not because prayer, prayer's about becoming more than it is about doing. It's about who we are before God. It's just about being authentic. Be you. Just talk to God. Hmm. And then we deepen in it and then we mature in it. So if Psalm 1 and 2 prepare us for prayer, nothing actually prepares us for Psalm 3. The start of Psalm 3. Oh, Lord, I've got so many enemies. So many are against me. So many are saying God will never rescue him. It's brief. It's urgent. It's frightened. It's someone in trouble. Someone crying out to God for help. And actually, we can all relate to, relate to that. The language is personal, it's direct, it's desperate. And actually, the language of prayer, the, our language of talking to God is forged in the crucible of trouble. It gets its start, actually, in the pressure of pain. We need help. And we need another. We need God. Intimacy is the first language we learn. I've been privileged to have a couple of children during my life. They're now adult children. But I remember when they were first born and over those first few years, I used to I used to love making them laugh. And I would do it in all kinds of crazy ways. You know, things that you think, oh, my gosh, that is just like 
And they sit there laughing, and so you do it again. You ever tried that one? You do these like these crazy things, these crazy sounds, and and it's it's intimate, it's intimacy, it's the exchange of gurgles and hums, and what's happening, trust develops. It's intimacy, it's relationship, and actually, we forget, but that's our primary language. It's how we came into the world, and and Jesus taught us to pray. He taught us how to talk to God, how to have a conversation with God. He taught the disciples, and he said, when you pray, say, and in our language, Daddy, Abba, Father, Daddy. It's intimate language. And then, of course, as we grow, as we start to grow up, we find a wonderful world of things around us. And everything's got a name. Rock, water, a doll, a bottle, a finger, a colker. Everything's got a name. And day after day, we add words And then the names are not strange anymore. And then we explore and we make friends and then we learn to speak in sentences and we start to connect things. And then along the way, although we probably do this even earlier while we're learning information, we start to understand motivation, even though we can't put a word to it, because we discover early on that words have the power to make things happen. I don't want to do this, a little child will say. And then as a parent, you have a moment to handle. And we have to arrest a tantrum with maybe just a word, stop, or please be quiet, or eat everything that's on your plate. And we we try to motivate. And actually, I've realized, as I thought about this, information and motivation are most of the language that we use. It's most of what we use today. And actually, intimacy, this language of trust and relationship and hope, it just takes a back seat. Mm. Intimacy is the language of the Psalms. It's the language of prayer. And it's the language that's most necessary to us, actually, in our humanity. It's the language where we, we find out who we are, who we're with what love looks like, who God is. That's why I think the Psalms are necessary. It doesn't mean that information and motivation are less important in a life of faith. It just means that they're grounded, they're rooted in intimacy. Otherwise, they just become shallow. It's the language we first learned. And learning to pray actually isn't anything new. It's in some respects, respects, it's recovering our first language. It's the language of what we are and who we're becoming. Psalm 1 and 2 prepare us to pray. We enter Psalm 3. And interestingly, in that Psalm I just prayed a moment ago, that place of fear, that place of desperateness, a a desperate cry for help. At the start of that Psalm, Right before you pray it, it says this little phrase, a psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. When he fled from Absalom, his son. It was a prayer that was prayed in story. If you don't know this part of King David's life, his son, basically, there was a palace coup. It ended up in civil war. David had to flee for his life. And he ended up in this war with his son. He was fighting his son. His son was fighting him. And in the end, David got his throne back. But it was a huge cost. He lost his son's life. His son died in the fight. Interestingly, a lot of David's life is wrapped up in these kinds of stories Loads of incidences like this. But actually, when I think about it, everyone's life is. We might not be involved in a palace coup or hopefully not the treachery of and betrayal of a son. But pain, loss, betrayal, suffering, lies, fear, salvation. 
all of it's actually wrapped up in our lives and every day is a story. Everything's connected and there is meaning everywhere. That adds up to life that is a story. And prayer, these tools of prayer are prayed in your story and they're prayed in mine. It's interesting to note in these tools of prayer, in almost all of the ones that highlight a part of David's story, it's in moments of trouble. <laughs> I think he was trying to highlight something for us. We pray out of need. We cry out for help. Another thing that's important with these tools is that because they're poetry, you can't rush poetry. It's almost like you've got to, as you're praying and reading the poet, you've almost got to slow your mind down and in prayer, slow our lives down to the pace of the poet's breathing into the rhythm of the poetry. It's interesting as people of faith, when we talk about rhythm, we often think about the creation story when, when God created the heavens and the earth and it says that lovely phrase, and there was evening and there was morning the next day. Well, it's interesting to me that the way the Psalms have been arranged, Psalm four and five, the very next Psalms, Psalm four is an evening prayer and Psalm five is a morning prayer. What do most of us do in the evening? Not everyone, because I guess some actually work night shifts. Uh, God bless you if that is your world. But most of us in the evening go to bed at some point. What do you do when you go to bed? You hopefully sleep and you relinquish control of everything, of your stuff, your relationships, everything that's going on in your life. You have to relinquish the control of that. Whether you do it intentionally or not, you're not in control of it when you're asleep. And so actually, Psalm 4 and this evening prayer is an opportunity for us to give the control back to God, to surrender our life to God and ask for God's blessing in our sleep. Because while we're sleeping, God's still working, working in us. And Psalm 5 opens you awake and it's beautiful the way Psalm 5 opens as a morning prayer because the psalmist, this poet, has this expectation that God is going to answer prayer. <laughs> Here's the thing. We can doubt the value, the power or even the sincerity of our asking God, but not his hearing. It's because our prayers are heard that we pray not because we're good at asking true prayer is sure of a hearing the other thing you'll find with these tools is that they're full of metaphor metaphor is wonderful because it brings to life the language of, of what we're understanding you know when i prayed earlier on that God, let me be like a tree that's planted by rivers of water. That's not a literal thing. It's a metaphor to say, I want to be rooted in you. I want to be rooted in the source of your life, to be fruitful, to be useful, to bear fruit in season, in the, in the seasons that you dictate and you decide to bear fruit in season. The Psalms are, are full of metaphor. And what do they do? They, they ground our lives in something deep something rich so that our prayers don't become kind of like this abstract spirituality of language that nobody can understand and even God's like what are you talking about no it's like we earth it and we ground it into stuff that's real you know when I walk in a park and walk one of my favorite parks has got a stream that's running through it in Leicestershire it's a beautiful park when I walk through that park and I see the trees that are planted by the streams of water, I often think of this prayer. Why? Because I'm, I'm grounding it in something real, something earthy, something that's around me right now. And I sense and I experience God in the midst of what's real to me, metaphor. And as we pray these 
Psalms, it's like we're ushered into the pew of all of Israel's worship, if you like, our liturgy before God. And then, of course, there's the issue of enemies. (laughs) Here's the thing I've found with praying these prayers. It's not too long before you end up in difficult country. You might be experiencing something difficult right now in your life. Goodness knows I have many times in my life. And these prayers carry us into that place. It's, it's a place where we become aware of difficult things, of evil. It's easy to be honest before God in our great moments, isn't it? It's a little bit more difficult when we're trying to be honest with God with our hurts and almost impossible to be honest with God when we're in our darkest moments of, dare I say, hate or bitterness or betrayal. In those moments, God still sees and God still knows all things. So actually, just pray who you are. The psalmist says in another psalm, trust in the Lord with all your heart and pour out your heart before him because God is a refuge for us. What's the psalmist saying there? He's saying you can go to God. It's safe to go to God with your anger. It's safe to go to God with your hatred. Could I say with your bitterness, with your pain, with your celebration, with your thanksgiving, with all of it, take it to God in prayer. Because God is always at work in us. When we live a life of faith, God is always at work and God is always speaking. He just wants us to respond. You know, when the psalmist said, forget not all his benefits, that word benefit in the original Hebrew means that God is active to complete something. He started a work in your life and he's faithful to complete that, whatever that might be. Not just the end game, not just the eternal part of that story, but you right now, in your life right now, he's faithful to complete. They're the benefits of God. And the psalmist encourages us not to forget them because when we do forget that God's at work, we start trying to make it happen. (laughs) And in our humanness, we don't do a very good job, do we? I don't do a very good job. And actually, that's why the psalm is saying, don't forget what he's done. Don't forget that God's at work in you. Hmm. Remembering what God has done, what God is doing. It's not just an orientation to the past. It's more than that, but it's, it's drawing from our past experience of God into our very present, who he is and how he works in us. Fuel for the path right now. St. Augustine, he found that the best model for developing the integrating experience of past, present and future was the audible praying of the Psalms. And you know, as, as, the, as this toolbox, as it ends at Psalm 150, it ends with this phrase, praise the Lord. You see, all, all our prayers, the whole of our life is in view of praise. That's the final response. That's where it's taking us to. The end of prayer, if you like, is praise. Now, Pastor Johnny mentioned to us a little while back in one of his messages that the, this toolbox of 150 psalms were arranged into, into five areas, if you like, of toolbox. And at the end of every one of them, there's this praising phrase, this praising benediction. Why? Because praise has this element of future to it. It's pulling us into the region of completion, into a life that is completed, a place of glory and praise. And so the Psalms, they're tools for prayer. A bit like when I first got used to this Colking gun, just getting used to it, handling it. Perhaps you've never prayed a Psalm before, perhaps you've never used one of these tools. These tools that God is working his, his will in us through. These tools that we use to collaborate with his work with us tools that we use to answer him. Or maybe 
today. Open the Psalms. Open at Psalm 1. I actually worked it out in the maths. I'm pretty sure if you start today, there's 150 of them. Just pray one each day. You'll finish praying them on January the 4th next year. But not only would I encourage you to pray one a day, why not start there? Some will take you 20 seconds, some will take you 20 minutes. Pray them sequentially, regularly, faithfully across the rest of your life. Just pray a psalm a day. And you will become more and more yourself. So let's pray. Psalm 25, verse 4 and 5. Show me your ways, Lord, and teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me. For you are my God, my Saviour, and my hope is in you every day. Amen. Thank you for joining us for our message. If there was something that resonated with you or you want to explore a little bit more about Jesus, then go to renewalcc.com forward slash next steps. You can fill out the form there and we can connect with you. Also, if you have a question for the team or you just want to say hello, then you can get in contact with us at hello at renewalcc.com and one of the team will be in touch with you. Also, we want you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and you can also go to renewalcc.com forward slash media where you can find our Spotify and Apple podcast channels where you can find all our messages and all our online content and there's a new episode being released every Monday. Finally, if you like the work that we do, you can also donate to Renault. If you go to renaultcc.com forward slash give, you can find all the ways in which you can give into the life of Renault. But thanks for joining us and we'll see you next time.